working. Okay, enough about death. So let's say you're not dying. That's good, right? You're living. How do you get energy for this process over and over and over again? 500 times a second, I said. What do you do? Well, sometimes during this energy supply need, muscle cells can use something that many people uh, have heard of before, don't really know what it does. Muscle cells will store, they will store, they won't store ATP, it's too big, it's too bulky, it can't be stored, it's just not good chemistry-wise. speak, chemistry wise. Muscle cells will, in fact, store something people have heard of, something called creatine. Specifically, it's called creatine phosphate. Okay, so many people who work out or who know somebody work out, they know that uh, this is a supplement people take. Why is that? Why is creatine phosphate good? People say it provides energy, but that's not good enough for me. I want to know what it is that provides the energy. What about creatine phosphate allows muscle cells to work better? And this is the following reason. Creatine phosphate. It has a phosphate. It has a phosphate molecule. That means that creatine phosphate, as it's stored, has the ability to transfer, and it does, transfer its phosphate to ADP to make, to make ATP. This would mean that whenever you have an ADP that was the result of a hydrolysis, right? ATP hydrolysis makes ADP. Let's say you run out of these inorganic phosphates for whatever reason. You have a phosphate that can be utilized via this creatine phosphate. An enzyme will take the phosphate off of creatine phosphate, high energy phosphate, and slap it onto ADP to give you a nice, fresh, new ATP molecule. There's a lot of energy in this ATP molecule that can be utilized furthermore. So what we notice overall is that the creatine phosphate possesses this ability to aid in ATP formation, okay? To aid in ATP formation post hydrolysis of ATP. But the one caveat about this, the one stipulation is that this doesn't happen forever. We have a very, very short supply of this. This is why we kind of take supplements. Sometimes people take supplements for this reason. There's only enough natural supply of creatine phosphate within our muscle cells, enough supply for about 15 seconds, 15 seconds of contractions. That is not a lot of time. Um, after those 15 seconds, you've used up all of your creatine phosphate stores, and then you cannot utilize that to continue to make ATP, to continue to do a sliding filament model of muscle contraction. So it's only about 15 seconds. That's why you sometimes see uh, people take supplements to increase their stores of creatine phosphate. This is kind of why you never see people drinking or eating ATP. It's not possible. Creatine phosphate, possible, doesn't give you that much, but it gives you that extra little push sometimes people want during exercise and extreme forms of um, activity. So that's creatine phosphate, I think that's very relevant. But now, finally, this is the boring one, but it's the most important one, it's good old glycogen. Glycogen is our number one form of chemical energy. Glycogen is chemical energy within our bodies. Lots and lots of it is stored within our muscle cells. You will often see people who are elite athletes have lots and lots of glycogen stored, lots stored in muscle cells. If you remember all the way from bio one, when we talked about macromolecules, we stated that glycogen is a macromolecule of glucose stored in the muscle and also the liver. And this is where we're going to see it. It's stored in the muscle because there's lots of energy within glycogen. But it's not just the glycogen molecule that has energy within it. Glycogen is a macromolecule. It has many, many glucoses. And that's what we're going to utilize. What glycogen does and what we can use glycogen for is take it, break it down, and it breaks it, break it down, um, I'll say break down for glucose. Glucose is stored in the form of glycogen for glucose. This gives you lots. Remember, glucose as C6H12 gives you lots of ATP. Remember, that's the beginning of cell respiration. ATP, about 30 ATP molecules during every cell respiratory event, that's a lot of ATP in a very quick amount of time via aerobic keyword here now, aerobic cell respiration. So what's the requirement of aerobic cell respiration? You need oxygen. But what's going to happen sometimes, let's say you're doing an extreme activity, you're doing some sort of extreme form of working out or running or whatever it may be, you start to breathe heavily. And the amount of oxygen you're taking in cannot satisfy the amount of ATP you need. It's just not how it's going to work. So what sometimes happen is um, you're going to have a low amount of oxygen supply. So let's say if the O2 supply you're taking in, you're not breathing enough oxygen, 
because you're running so fast or you're doing some sort of activity that's causing you to breathe awkwardly or not efficiently. If this O2 supply is low, you actually cannot use aerobic respiration anymore. You need to use anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic cell respiration. Now, what's the key here about anaerobic? Anaerobic means without oxygen, and it makes sense. Your oxygen supply is low, you're running a lot, you're breathing all this oxygen in, but it's not enough for all your muscles to successfully continue running, so you're going to utilize anaerobic cell respiration. And in order to do that, you utilize a process called lactic acid fermentation. So what happens is if you skip everything post-glycolysis, because remember, glycolysis is anaerobic, if you just take the product of glycolysis, that product can undergo lactic acid fermentation and give you some ATP, not a lot, but certainly give you enough ATP to continue doing something, but not for a long time. You can't do this anaerobic action for a long time unless you're in great shape. The whole idea of being in great shape is the capability to do anaerobic cell respiration for a long time because anybody can do aerobic cell respiration, but a length of anaerobic respiration is critical for successful long-term activity. And so you utilize lactic acid fermentation, but this, the consequence of this is that this oftentimes leads to muscle fatigue. Why is that? Well, as an anaerobic process, you're going to get lactic acid, which is acidic. That is going to build up. And if lactic acid builds up, you get a low pH within the muscle cells, and a low pH within muscle cells gives you this feeling of fatigue. Some people associate this with the burn of exercise. When you feel that burn, when you're doing something that involves a lot of exercise, that's that lactic acid fermentation happening. Now, I want to just make a note. Um, this is a common idea, but believe it or not, recent research has stated that this may not be 100% true. So I just want to put uh, maybe next to this. I'm not sure if your lecturers did this, but I want to make sure I'm giving you the correct information. This is a big maybe. There's a lot of research that states that this is not the reason we feel muscle fatigue. It's about a 50-50 debate. It's an interesting point. It's not something that's solved actually yet. So I encourage you to look this up, whether or not this is true. Um, it's shown on the Wikipedia page if you're interested. And I just want to make sure it's clear that this may or may not be exactly why you feel fatigue. But for the purposes of this course and your exam and whatever it may be, this is why you feel muscle fatigue. Hopefully that makes it very clear. That's our energy supply. We're done with sliding filament model. Let's finish up this lecture by looking at the rest of the muscles and skeletals.